Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out this afternoon on such a rainy day. What else could you be doing? This is pretty great. Yeah. I uh, need to do a little housekeeping first before I introduce our speaker. Um, please turn off your cell phones. Our lectures are recorded, and we don't want to pick up people's phones that are ringing. You'll be able to listen to this lecture again on YouTube. Usually, Mickey gets it up in two to three weeks after the event. I want to talk about our sponsors. Um, my name is Grace Mary Brady, and I'm the president of the Bayside History Museum. Vincent Turner, who's sitting up there, is the vice president of the Bayside History Museum. We have Olivia and Barbara and other museum members here. Stand up, Barbara. You're getting introduced. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine. These are all of our wonderful volunteers at the Bayside History Museum. Another sponsor is our Calvert Library. Robin, okay, Robin, stand up. <laughs> Calvert Library. And then the Daughters of the American Revolution. Again, we're going to have myself, Barbara, and Catherine stand up because they're also a sponsor and members of the Daughters of Revolution. Okay. Um, I want to acknowledge the elected officials that are in the audience. First, I, I don't think he needs any introduction, but the former mayor of North Beach, Mark Frazier, would you stand, please? Uh, council member from Chesapeake Beach, Larry Jaworski, who always comes to our events. We really appreciate that. And the most important town council member, because he's also a master in IT, is Mickey Hummel, who's standing in the back. And he records everything and puts it out there on YouTube for posterity. Okay, ready, Ralph? Right. Ralph Eshelman is a specialist in polar exploration, military, and maritime history. The War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, geology, and vertebrate paleontology. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan with a major in geology and vertebrate paleontology and a minor in ecology. Ralph is most known in this area for being the first director of the Calvert Marine Museum in Solomons. The citizens of this county are so fortunate to have such a wonderful facility in our midst. Ralph was the former owner of Eshelman and Associates, which is a cultural resource <coughs> management consulting firm. He's a partner in a lighthouse preservation firm. He was a consultant to the National Park Service during the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812 in the Chesapeake, which resulted in the publication of five books. Um, Ralph is currently working on a new book about the Patuxent River, which will be published by the Calvert Marine Museum. And he has so many friends and individuals who follow all of his explorations and adventures on Facebook. Mr. Eshelman. Well, thank you very much, Grace Mary. Very generous introduction and a big thank you to all of you for coming out today. Appreciate it very much. Jokingly, Grace Mary said, would you do another lecture for us? And some of you may know I've given quite a few in the series here. And so I jokingly said, well, how about one on elephants of Maryland? And she didn't even think it was funny. She immediately said yes. <laughs> and so that's where we are this, this afternoon. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And in case you uh, are not aware of it, most of this is going to be really about fossils. Because we don't have living elephants in Maryland, other than the Baltimore Zoo. They have a live cam. You can go online and you can see them at certain hours of the day. And when we used to have circuses that came through Maryland, oftentimes they had elephants. But other than going to the National Zoo, which is now the District of Columbia, which was originally part of Maryland, that's another place where you could see elephants. But the only way you're going to see an elephant today is primarily through fossils. And there are several museums in this area that have fossils of elephants on display, including our Calvert Marine Museum, <coughs> also the Natural History Society of Maryland. I'm going to have a big announcement at the end. They've just established the first mount of a mammoth on display. That's in Baltimore. 
and I think you might be surprised to know that one of the first mounts of a fossil ever exhibited in North America was at one time on exhibit in Baltimore. So there's some interesting things related to elephants that a lot of people don't always particularly recognize. You can see from the title, I'm talking about mammoths, mastodons, and gompotheres. I think most of you know a mammoth and a mastodon. They lived during the Ice Age. Fewer of you may be familiar with gompotheres. And we'll go into more about this, but gompotheres is an extinct group of elephants that used to live in the, what we call Maryland today, and we have fossils of them at Calvert Cliffs. And we have, in Maryland, some of the earliest elephants known in North America. We're going back 14 million years. That's pretty impressive. So most of us don't think of Maryland in association with elephants, but in fact, we really do have uh, quite a uh, relationship there. So, let me get on my glasses here, so I can get the right button. Obviously, this is a circus, and this is in Maryland. This is from the uh, Maryland State Archives. It's a photograph that's online, and I don't recall exactly what town it is, but this is an example of what you could have seen when you were younger. Unfortunately, today, this is not the kind of thing that happens anymore. And these are just some good photographs to remind us of what elephants look like. Kingdom Animalia. That's all of the animals in the world belong to that kingdom. We're not plants. We as humans are part of that. We are animals. The phylum, chordata, that means animals with a backbone and with a spinal cord that is protected by it. So all of the animals that have that characteristic are known as chordata. Mammalia, we are also mammals. What does that mean? That's all of the animals in the world, <coughs> extinct and living, that give live birth. Their young are fed by milk, and they have hair. If you don't have those three characters, you are not a mammal. And some of you might say, well, a whale is a mammal. Does whales have hair? Yes, they do. They have little whiskers. That's all that's essentially left. But that's all you need. And then how about elephants? You don't think of elephants as having hair, but how about that tail? What do you think the tip of that tail is made of? Very long pieces of hair. And even on the one over on the upper right, you can see some hair up on the top of the head of that particular animal. So that's what a, a mammal is. Now, proboscidean, we haven't used that term yet, but that means proboscis. What is a proboscis? It's a prehensile nose. It means that you have a nose that is long enough that you can move it around. And all of you know that elephants can do that. So the proboscis that we think of as an elephant's trunk is actually an extension of its nose. What can you do with a prehensile nose? An elephant can actually pick up a log with its nose. An elephant can hold its baby when it's young with its nose. An elephant can swim in the oceans and use its proboscis as a periscope so that it can breathe, even if its head is under the water. We can't do that unless we're perfectly in flat water. <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing tool when you think about it. Are there other animals that have a prehensile nose? There's not another animal that has a nose as long as an elephant. But like tapers have a nose that they can move around. They can't do all the things that an elephant can do. But there are other mammals that have a prehensile <coughs> nose. But the elephant is the ultimate. I think elephants are pretty cool animals. I'm showing you this image because it's not a great image, but it's an artist's conception of what probably was the largest elephant that we know of that ever existed in the world. And it had a height at its shoulders, this is an estimation, of about 17 feet. So imagine you, a typical human being six feet or even usually a little bit less, standing next to this animal 
your height would not even equal the half of the height of what this prehistoric extinct elephant would have been. This is just showing you the diversity of the proboscidea. If you look over to the right, that smallest one that you see way, if I can get the right pointer, way over there, that is an ancestor of the elephant. It doesn't even look like an elephant. Because when we think of elephants, we think of long tusks, we think of big ears, but the ancestors of elephants didn't look like that. But all the rest of these animals have been put on here based on size. So this is that large one that I was talking about. Here you can see a human for scale. On this particular scale, it only goes up to 16 feet. So depending on your source of information, everything is not precise. Some people say an estimation of 17.1 inches. Other people estimate somewhat less than that. So that's why this particular image doesn't show them at 17 feet. So what are the guys that we're particularly interested in today? We're interested in the mammoth. We're interested in, there's two different types of mammoths. There is the Columbian mammoth, and there's the woolly mammoth, two different species. We're also interested in the mastodon. I hope all of you realize that these are extinct. They do not live today. And then lastly, we're interested in the gompotheres, the gompotherium. And these are the ancient ancestors of all of the elephants that lived in North America that have now become extinct. This is showing a similar situation, but instead we're looking at the teeth of these animals. And if you look at the left and you go all the way across until you get out to here, all of these teeth have cusps. And that means that these animals were herbivores. That means that they're eating things like shrubs, branches, leaves. And in order to digest that, they have to chomp it. So their upper and their lower teeth have cusps. And all of that vegetative material is being chomped up to make it easier for them to digest it when it gets into their stomach. But if you look at the two on the far right over here, they don't have cusps. You can make out that instead the enamel are like bands, and they're flat. That's because these animals were grazers. They were eating grasses. And when you eat grass, think about a cow. When you see them chewing their cud, they're rubbing their teeth together like this. The upper jaw and the lower, they're rubbing like this. They're grinding it like two millstones to grind that up to make it easier for digestion. All of the other elephants that I've talked about, the mammoths and the mastodons, I'm sorry, the, the, ma the mastodons and the gompotheres, they're doing the chomping. A completely different way of eating. This looks complex. Don't worry about it. This is the geological time scale of Earth. Everything on the right-hand side, which is red, represents Earth prior to anything that lived on Earth. And you probably can't see it where you are, but way down here, when Earth was first formed, we're talking about over four billion years ago. No elephants. If you go over to the next one, which is called the Paleozoic, this is the age of when fishes were very common in the sea, and also there were little tiny anthropods called trilobites. Any of you that collect fossils and whatnot, you're familiar with that term. They're also extinct. But this was the time of animals that are very different from the kinds of animals that we have today. If you come into the Mesozoic, I hope all of you immediately can say, that's the age of the dinosaurs. That's not to say there weren't other animals in the world, but dinosaurs, reptiles, they really dominated the earth. They were in the sky, they were in the seas, and they were on land. The most prominent animal at that time. But if you come out here to the Cenozoic, which is on the left-hand side, this is much more recent. And I'm going to give you a detail of the upper portion of the Cenozoic, because that's really what we're interested in today. So Holocene, that's the time that we live right now. There are some people who have gone ahead and have separated the Holocene from what they call the Anthropocene to show the difference between when humans were here and when, when humans were not here. 
but most people still stick with Holocene. So we're living in the Holocene right now. The Pleistocene is a subdivision of what's known as the Quaternary, and that's also, most of us look at that as the Ice Age. That's a little bit of a misnomer, because during the Pleistocene, there were periods of when it was warm and periods of when it was cold. So there were at least four major glaciations, but in between those, there were also interglacial periods when it was even warmer than it is today. So just to call it an ice age is so much of a, of a misnomer. If you get into the Neogene, that's a combination of what we call the Pliocene and the Miocene. I'm only bringing this to your attention because this is the age of Calvert Cliffs. The cliffs that we have on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, we have a little bit of Pliocene out there, but most of it is Miocene in age. That means we're talking about deposits that are around 14 million years old, the very oldest, that will go up to about 8 million years. That's a long, long time in geological history. Compared to the age of the Earth, it's just a moment in time. But for us, this is pretty significant because this is when the Proboscideans, specifically the Gompotheres, migrated from Europe into the New World, to what we call North America today. And we have fossils of them right here in Calvert County. So this is just a quick little kind of summary of what we've just talked about. If you look up at the top, you can see the Miocene. Down below, you can see it, a representation of a Gompotheer. And you see that line from the Gompotheer that goes out to the all of the mammoths and the living species of elephants that we have today in the world. But if you take that other blue line and you go down to the bottom, that's an offshoot of the mastodon. So the gonophyr and the mastodon, those are the chompers. They're the ones that have those teeth with the cones. All of the other elephants that you see on this are the grazers that have the kind of the millstone type of a, a grinding tooth. Very, very different. So let's talk a little bit about gompotheres first. We're going to go from the old, oldest to the youngest. This is a reconstruction of what this animal might have looked like. This was done by Mr. Shoemaker, uh, who works at the Calvert Marine Museum. He's a tremendous illustrator, and this is some of his work. Very pleased to be able to have it here in this show. If you look up at the top, you can see that same animal that uh, Shoe had done for us, and it's in comparison with the human, just to give you a sense of scale. You might have immediately picked up that these are very small teeth right here. These are deciduous teeth. These are the baby teeth of a gompothere. And you can see them right here represented in this particular illustration. This one and this one are adult teeth. So look at the difference between the, the baby teeth and the adults. Significant growth in these animals. And that's a pretty spectacular tooth right there. The fact that it's that complete. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this tooth. Just wanted to mention to you, if anyone is seriously interested in the evolution of elephants in Maryland, there was a poster session that was done by the Calvert Marine Museum. You might notice some of the names up there are familiar, including myself, as well as a Stephen Godfrey, who's the curator of paleontology. This is available online if you ever would like to take a look at it. Also, I wanted to point out to you, I'm kind of bragging a little bit, but all of us and some additional authors presently have a significant paper on all of the gompotheres of Calvert Cliffs that's being published by the Smithsonian Institution Scholarly Press. It's already been submitted, it's been returned, it's been accepted. We have to do some final little kind of editorial. It's going to go back and eventually it will be published. It probably will be out sometime later this year. This is a major contribution that summarizes everything we know about elephants, not just in Maryland, but actually in the Chesapeake Bay area. So I'm very much looking forward to when that becomes available. So let's take a look at the very first gompothere that we know of that was discovered in Maryland. And it has a little bit of an interesting story because the actual tooth is lost. We don't know where that tooth is. But what we do have are illustrations that were done by different people who published on it. And then off on the right, there's a cast of the original tooth. That's all we have. We do not know where the original tooth is. It's interesting that it may have been part 
of one of the very early natural history societies in Maryland in Baltimore. And unfortunately, we know that the Academy of Sciences of Baltimore, actually, that building burnt in the early 1800s, and it may be that that tooth was lost at that time. It's one of those unfortunate things that happens. This is the first bona fide gompothere that we actually have a specimen of. And where was this collected? At Governor's Run, Calvert County. And what you're looking at is the first drawing of it when it was published by the Smithsonian Institution. That was in 1950, really not that long ago when you think about it. And then on the right, this is an actual photograph of that specimen. In the 50s, you typically didn't have photographs in a lot of scientific publications. Today, publications are using color. So what you see on the right is one of the actual plates that will be in this particular publication that I was telling you about. What's interesting about this particular specimen, not only was it collected in Calvert County, but we know from the records of the Natural History Society of Maryland who found it and they recorded everything related to it. So this is one of the best specimens that we have from Maryland. It has good associated data about it. Who collected it? They mentioned how far up it was on the cliff face and all of that kind of good information that you typically don't get in a lot of this kind of stuff. This is a detail of that same tooth. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that in that red circle, you might be able to make out what I call matrix. In other words, that's the surrounding sediments that were found with the specimen. So many people that collect fossils, they want to clean it, make it as nice and shiny and perfect as possible. What you're actually doing is you're taking away good information related to that specimen. And so this specimen was never cleaned to the point that it lost all of that adhering matrix. And because of that, we were able to send out and get microanalysis of all of the very, very small fossils that were in that matrix, such as forams and diatoms. And then that gives us information as to what the environment was like when that tooth was deposited, and also helps us to get it, give it a better age to know where it was stratigraphically in the deposits. This is another example. This is the Collison tooth. And Mr. Collison, I don't know if he's in the audience here, but he lives not more than two miles from here. And he was putting in a drainage area on his property, and he found this tooth. And he was, in my opinion, good enough to notify another individual who was interested in paleontology. His name was uh, Paul Murdoch. Some of you may know him. Paul immediately notified the Calvert Marine Museum. We got permission from Mr. Collington to come to his property, do a complete excavation. We screened the entire area because the tooth was broken up. We found about another one-third of the total pieces of the tooth that we were able to piece it back together. We were able to do a stratigraphic profile. So this is another example of one of the teeth of these animals where we had excellent information. And it was found like two miles from where we are right now in a guy's backyard because he was doing some digging there. The other thing that's interesting about this tooth is we think this is the oldest tooth in Maryland. This tooth, if we have it correct, is zone 13 or 14, which would put it right around 14 million years ago. Most of the teeth that we're finding, like the ones from Governor's Run, they're slightly younger, on the order of about maybe 11 million years ago. So this tooth, we think, is extremely important. Uh, I should have just mentioned, uh, let me go back. Off to the right is that same tooth that I mentioned to you earlier. What's interesting about this tooth, and now I'll go to the next slide, is that this tooth was found by five different people. <laughs> it fell out of the cliff. It broke apart. Five different people found pieces of it. The Calvert Marine Museum was able to figure out who all of these people were and all of them donated their pieces so that we could have as complete a tooth as possible. And that's it right there. Now, what I'm showing you up in this photograph is that part of it included the upper palate of the skull. So what you're looking at is an upper tooth, and you can see where a second tooth would have been attached on the opposite side. 
The reason I'm telling you all of this is that there's a rumor that that second tooth exists. We don't know who has it. It may be in pieces. We don't know. But if anybody knows, I would sure like to know about it. Because it's very unusual to have more than one tooth from one individual. Very, very unusual. So this is a, to me, this is another example of a very special, very special tooth. This is another tooth that's a little bit unusual. This was pulled up by an oyster dredger on Skipton Creek, which is on the eastern shore of Maryland. Now what's interesting about Skipton Creek is that we don't know what formation it came from, but we do know that Calvert Formation, which is one of the oldest formations in this area, and equivalent to that other tooth that I mentioned to you that the Collington tooth came from, it may be another example of one of these earliest Compothere tooth, but we because it was dredged, we just don't have stratigraphic control about it. But you never know how a tooth is going to turn up. So, whoops, wrong way. Yeah, I'm going the wrong way again. This is another tooth. This one is not dredged, but this one came from the Chop Tank River. So this is another tooth on the eastern shore, directly across from Calvert County. Same age as the cliffs that we have right here in Calvert County. But this was found in a, on a cliff outcrop that was known as Boston Cliffs. Some of you may have, have actually heard of it. And what's interesting about this particular tooth is that if you look closely at it, you can see these little like burrows. Can you see them in the enamel? What that tells us is that this tooth was on the surface of the seabed long enough that burrowing clams had actually burrowed into the enamel of this tooth before it was buried in the sediments that it was in. So that's what they refer to as taphonomy. And it's a study of what happens to an animal after it dies and before it's deposited and formed into a fossil. So this has an interesting history there about itself. I hope by now, when you see this particular tooth, you're saying to yourself, this looks different from any other tooth that you have shown so far. It's much more elongate. It has many, many more cusps on it than any other tooth you've seen so far. When we saw this tooth, which, by the way, was collected at the foundation of the nuclear power plant back in the late 1960s, when they were putting in the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant, this was found when they were doing the foundation for it. And it, like many of these other teeth, was in many, many pieces. It's all been put together. Many of the workmen who were there at the time actually donated the pieces back. I could go into a long story about all of that. But anyway, that's a new, we think it's a new genus. But we're hesitant to name a new genus based on an isolated tooth. You typically don't do that. You need to have more specimens. And it's also good to have tusks because tusks are important in helping you to determine what genus it might belong to or whatever. This is another tooth that's very similar to the first one. And this was found by Augie Sleckman. Some of you may know Augie. He was a photographer for many of the local newspapers. And he found this tooth less than a mile from where the other tooth that I just showed you was located. We believe this is the same taxon that the other tooth is. But again, we're reluctant to name it. So in our paper, we're just saying we think this is a new genus but we're waiting for additional specimens before we actually name it. And then I'm showing you this tooth because I hope by now you're saying to yourself, this looks different from any other tooth you've shown me before. You don't, these other teeth, none of them had this kind of stuff going on the side there. So we think this is another example of another genus that's out there that we're hesitant to name for several different reasons. One of them is that this is the only specimen we have. And number two, it's not reposited in a typical museum. It's in the Museum of Creation, which is interesting because the Museum of Creation is a museum that tries to say that there's no such thing as evolution. And so it's an interesting dichotomy that that's where this tooth is located. We contacted the Museum of Creation. They loaned it to us, fully understanding what we were doing. They allowed us to make a cast cop a copy of it, do photographs and whatnot. So this is a very rare specimen 
that's being published in the Smithsonian Institution that belongs to a museum that counters evolution. It's, it's just one of these kind of crazy things that happens. This is a letter written from the Smithsonian to the woman who owned the tooth. This is a detail of the letter. And within there, you're, you can see where this is the curator at the Smithsonian at that time, Clayton Ray, who's still alive. He's in his 90s. And he was essentially saying to this lady, this is a very important tooth. We would hope that you would donate it uh, to the Smithsonian Institution, <laughs> which she never did. She donated it to the Creation Museum. Now, this is the best Gompothere specimen ever collected from the Chesapeake Bay. It's not from Maryland. It's from Virginia. But the age of the sediments are identical to what we have here in Maryland. And so what you're looking at is a left and right lower mandible with two teeth on each side. And you're also looking at two upper tusks and one lower tusk. This is, again, I'm going to repeat, the most complete specimen ever found of a gompothere in the Chesapeake. And I'll go so far as to say it's the most complete specimen of a gompothere found east of the Mississippi River. This is an extremely significant specimen. The guy who found this <coughs> agreed to donate it to the Calvert Green Museum in exchange for the museum providing him with casts. And if you hold the casts next to the original specimens, other than the weight, you can't tell them apart. So this is a phenomenal donation by this particular individual, which we're very much appreciative of. That is going to be a new genus, and the species is going to be named after the gentleman who donated it. And you'll find all about that in the publication that will be coming out soon. This is a map of the Chesapeake Bay, and you might be able to make out the red dots. For example, there's several red dots here. There's a couple here on the Patuxent River couple here on the Potomac River. There's even a couple way down here. These are all known gompothere specimens from the Chesapeake Bay area that are in this paper that I've been telling you a little bit about. Why would these elephant remains be located where they are? So I want to remind you Calvert Cliffs. I think everybody here knows that Calvert Cliffs is made up of sediments of a shallow sea that once covered this area. If we were to go back 14 million years ago, over top of us would be about 20 feet of water right now. It would be a shallow marine environment. It wouldn't be open ocean. It would be like a big cove of an ocean. So all of that area that I showed you previously, well, all of those dots were part of what we would call the Calvert Sea. So this blue line that you see represents what would have been the shoreline about 14 million years ago. So that means that if you lived in Washington, D.C., which is right there, or up here in Baltimore, you would be essentially at the seashore. Today, if you want to go to the seashore, you know where Ocean City is, how far you've got to go. So that just gives you an indication as to how things have changed so much over geological time. In summary, thinking about gompotheres, we think there's at least three genus of gompothere that lived in what we call the Chesapeake Bay today. Only one of them is identified to genus. The other two remain unidentified, but hopefully with new information, new material, we'll be able to eventually name those. But it raises a question. Animals live in competition with one another. So why would there be three different genera of gompotheres living in the same area? And all of them were herbivores. All of them were feeding as browsers. That means they're in competition with one another. And so the next area of study that we want to get to is a micro, -analogy, micro analogies of the tooth cusp to see if we can determine if they were eating different types of food. Was one of them perhaps eating a particular types of shrubs? Was another one eating particular types of shrubs that only form maybe on the edge of a forest? Others were maybe interior forests? There had to be some type of a, a niche 
where these animals occupied, but we just don't have enough information to be able to say what that niche might have been. Okay, gompotheres are done. Let's take a look at mastodons. So on the left you can see the American mastodon, on the right you can see the woolly mammoth, and then way over on the extreme right you can see the living elephant. The one on the right is not extinct, the one on the left and the one in the middle, they are extinct. And you can see, particularly in the shape of the tusks, the mastodon has relatively short tusks. The mammoth has these amazing curving tusks that come out and then go up, much more elaborate. That tells you right there the difference between a herbivore and a grazer. This is the skeleton of a mastodon. And this is a map that dates from the 1920s. And on the left, it's showing all the known specimens of mammoth. And on the right, all of the known specimens of mastodon. And you can imagine since then, there's been many, many additional specimens that have been found. But the key thing that I'm pointing out to you is that there are many fewer mammoth specimens than there are mastodon specimens. And if you look at the circle of the Chesapeake Bay area, you can see there's only two that in the 1920s were even known from the Chesapeake Bay area. And over on the right, there were many more. So it would be more desirable to have a fossil of a mammoth or a mastodon. To me, it would be a mammoth because they're much rarer. Nowhere near as prolific as were the mastodons. So this is the first illustration of a mastodon that was found in Maryland. And I just wanted to point out to you that the individual who found it, his name was Hayden. His name is Ray, let's go back. His name is Ray Ayer. And what's interesting about this guy is that he was identified as the father of dentistry in America. So we had a dentist who had found this particular specimen and studied it because he's interested in teeth. The other thing that's interesting about it, and I think it might be on this next slide, I hope. No, it's not. I'll get to it in a minute. I also wanted to point out to you that there was a, another gentleman by the name of Oler, who in 1931 did a paper on the history of proboscidea of Maryland. This was published by the Natural History Society of Maryland. And then also in the Natural History Society, there was a gentleman who did the mammals of Maryland. His name was Lee. And you'll see from this blow up here, he actually mentions some of the fossil elephants that have been known. And if you look in a detail of this, you'll see that he says, and I will read it to you, in digging a well in the new fort of, let me get that, in the star fort of Fort McHenry, a tooth of the mastodon, and then he says, or mammoth, was found in the depth of nearly 60 feet below the surface. So the first evidence that we have of this particular elephant was found at Fort McHenry, 60 feet below the surface. I mean, think of the chances of digging a well anywhere, and boom, you come into this fossil. Not too impressive, but what you're looking at here are baby teeth in a tibia. A tibia is one of the bones down here in this leg from a mastodon found in a cave out in Cumberland. The date of the cave is 700,000 years ago. So this is the earliest mastodon from Maryland found in a cave called Cumberland Bone Cave. And these specimens, as well as all of these teeth, are all from a juvenile. And we think what happened is that a baby probably had been taken by a predator and taken into the cave and eaten, and this is the remains of that baby elephant. Other than that, we have nothing else. But this is the earliest example we have of mastodon in the state of Maryland, except for this. And for those of you with good eyes, you might be able to make out that that is a mastodon tooth. And this was found in another cave, not far from Cumberland Bone Cave, that's on state property. 
Department of Natural Resources has closed the cave. It was only discovered about five years ago. It's believed to be the largest cave in Maryland. And the reason they closed it is that it's, it's pristine inside. Humans have never been inside of it. So DNR has kept it secret where it's located. And they're doing studies to determine what is the natural life that's in that cave today and anything else that they can learn from that cave. And we also know that there's a good paleontology record there as well. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to get into this cave and see how this compares with Cumberland Bone Cave. Is it as old as Cumberland Bone Cave? Is it less old? At this point, we just don't know. But this potentially is another very, very early mastodon from Maryland. I wanted to so sh show you some examples of mastodon teeth. These are all from the collections of the Smithsonian Institution. And the reason I'm showing them to you is that they were collected in Southern Maryland. And if you look at the catalog number, you see up at the top, USNM, that's United States National Museum. And then there's a V, that means it's a vertebrate. And then you have the number. The number is 201. This means that this is the 200th and first specimen in the Smithsonian Institution collections. And it came from St. Mary's County, our sister county right across the river. Why would we have these early examples at the Smithsonian Institution? Here's another example. Um, this was actually in the collections of the Calvert Marine Museum. This is from uh, Prince George's County on the Patuxent River. This is a label to one of these specimens that I'm going to show you right here, which is very unusual. It doesn't look particularly attractive, but the significance of this is that you see the adhering gravel and sand. You don't typically find fossils that are preserved in gravel and sand. And that's because water can flush through that, and it causes the bone, the organic material, to disintegrate very quickly. Usually, fossils are preserved in things like silts and clays, where it can, it can kind of keep out the water, and it has a better chance of being preserved. So this is a very unusual preservation of a tooth found on the Patuxent River. Here's another example. What's the catalog number here? 200. So this was the molar that was cataloged probably the same day by the same individual as the previous one that was 201 that I showed you. And who was it collected by? That's the artist's rendition when it was first published. If I can get it to come up in that circle. Probably no one here ever heard of Jay Varden, but you will by the time we're done here. Here's another tooth. You probably can't make it out very well, but Jay Varden. Here's another tooth. Jay Varden. Jay Varden. Who was Jay Varden? He was a guy who lived in Washington, D.C., and used to go collecting in Southern Maryland, collected fossils. We're talking about the early 1800s. And he formed a museum in Washington, D.C., and it was called the Washington Museum of Curiosities. And he charged people a fee to come into his museum. Well, lo and behold, you might see if you, if you read this, it talks about the National Institute. What was the National Institute? The Smithsonian Institution. That opened in 1840. And guess what? Free admission. Who's going to pay money to go into this guy's Museum of Curiosities when you can go into the Smithsonian for free? So they reached a deal where the Smithsonian bought his collection, and then he became an assistant curator of the Smithsonian Institution. And so these specimens that he collected in Southern Maryland, some of them from Calvert County, were among the very first specimens that became part of the Smithsonian Institution. It's kind of something that people who live here have no idea. It's just really, to me, it's incredible. It's really amazing. This is one that's not in the Smithsonian Institution. This was dredged by an oysterman off of where the nuclear power plant is, and it was donated to the Calvert Marine Museum. So you never know where these things are going to come from. Okay, let's take a look at... Uh, Mammoths now. We've, we've done gompotheres, we've done mastodons. Let's take a look at mammoths. This is the first illustration of a mammoth tooth found in Maryland. 
It was not found in Calvert County. It was found in Queen Anne's County. But it's a, it's a pretty nice tooth. Unfortunately, the location of this tooth is lost as well. We have no idea where it is. So the only record we have are these drawings of it. We do have this. Not anywhere near as nice. This is a thoracic vertebrae of a mammoth. And this was found by John Nance, who's the curator of collections at the Calvert Marine Museum. And he was wading out in the mud off of St. Mary's County in the Chesapeake Bay and stumbled on this. And he collected it. I was able to identify it for him to separate it. Is it mastodon or is it mammoth? And it's mammoth, which means it's relatively rare in Maryland. You guys know that now. And my question to John is, I said, why would you have an isolated vertebrae sitting out in the muds of the Chesapeake Bay? I said, where's the rest of it? I mean, that animal probably died and it got dispersed, but I'll bet you there's other bones of this animal and possibly the teeth out there. <coughs> and because it's relatively rare, we need to keep an eye out for this. So all these low tides that we have and whatnot, that's the time to go out and try to look for these kinds of things. You never know what's going to turn up. I wanted to spend a little bit of time and talk to you about what's known as the Englewood mammoth. And the reason is that this is the most complete mammoth that we have ever found in Maryland, and it's a controversial. The reason it's controversial is that some of the early studies of this particular animal suggested that maybe it had been killed by human beings. <laughs> Anytime you get into that category, you know it's going to be controversial. So to make a long story short, I'm just going to go through this very quickly with you. This is one of the drawers of the Smithsonian. That specimen was collected by the Smithsonian. You're looking at the dorsal spines of some of the vertebrae. Off on the left, you can see part of the uh, scapula of the animal. That lower jaw that I showed you previously, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful specimen. There was a paper that was done by Landon Carr in 2013. And he's the one who postulated that maybe this was killed by human beings. And some of the evidence that he used is pretty questionable in my opinion. There was this rock that was found with it. And if you look at the scale, that rock would just barely fit into the palm of my hand. That's pretty small. And he says perhaps this was a hammerstone. It would you use that to kind of crack open bones to get the marrow out or whatever it might be. Well, why isn't it just a cobble that happened to be there? How does he know that it was actually used by human beings? He goes into other differences in coloration of some of the different fragments of the bone, which to him suggested that it was these fragments were caused way back when this animal died. I can go on and on and on. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but at the very and he says, both cultural modification and the action of natural taphonomic processes should be considered as possibilities. Most people ignore that last sentence that he puts in there, and instead they jump to the conclusion that this is evidence of early humans killing an elephant in Maryland. I just want you to be aware, that's not what he is saying. He's saying it's possible. Well, there's been other studies that have been done since then that completely dispute any, any evidence at all that that might have been caused by Indians. And most of it was done by a fellow by the name of Gary Haynes. And he did a, a very complete study. Again, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but he went over all of these details that this other gentleman had presented, including this one, which is pretty interesting. This is a bone that that previous gentleman suggested might be an indication of where it had been punctured by some type of a hand tool. And what's interesting is that if you go along that bone, you can see this and this, which are highlighted here. And those are actually scars from when the Smithsonian Institution collected the bones with their tools. So this is a way to refute someone who comes up with a suggestion that that's a, an indication of human kill. No, it's an indication of human collecting, where they got too close to the bone and actually damaged it. And we can go on and on and on. I'm not going to bore you with it. I just wanted to show you some other examples. This does not look like your typical mammoth tooth. And the reason is because it's preserved in beeswax. This is a specimen that was collected in the 50s. 
And the technology has changed such that you would never use this today. But at that time, they would take heat lamps and they would melt beeswax into the specimen to preserve it. It's very unusual and it makes it look kind of weird and whatnot. But the significance of this tooth is where it was collected. Can you make that out? It was dredged off of Ocean City, Maryland. So this was found out on what is the continental shelf of Maryland when sea level was lower during one of those interglacial periods when elephants weren't just rolling around Calvert County today, but they were also off the coast of what is Ocean City, off the coast 60, 80 miles, because that's how much lower sea level was during maximum glacial periods. So what do you do with all that information? So Frank Whitmore, who happened to be my mentor from the Smithsonian Institution, he went and talked to these dredgers who were out there doing hard clam dredging and said, anytime you find one of these mammoth or mastodon bones, tell me the water depth, give me the latitude and longitude, let me know about it, and I'm going to record all of this and do a paper. And he did. And most of these specimens were coming out of Ocean City, Maryland. And this is the, a plot of all of the known specimens, not just that were collected by dredgers. These are the where is it? Here. These are the ones that have been dredged up. But these are all the known specimens that he had at that time. And you might note that he differentiated them by triangles and also by circles. So whether you knew it was a mastodon or whether it was a, a mammoth. So anyway, interesting studies. Does this painting ring a bell to some of you? It's, it's actually a very famous painting. And this was a, a painting by Charles Wilson Peale. And for those of you that are familiar with Baltimore, you might remember that he was a significant artist, but he also was a museum guy. And when he heard about this mammoth, this mastodon skeleton that had been found in New York, he sent a team of 35 men up there to excavate it. It cost him over $3,000. Wow. Now we're talking 1801. $3,000 was a lot of money back then. But he knew that if he could mount this, this would be something that he could make money on. And he charged 50 cents a person to come into his museum to see the mount of this mastodon. 50 cents in 1801. Think about that. That was a lot of money back then. That's almost equivalent to how much today. I don't know. Like a half a day's pay back then. Yeah. And anyway, in the first year, he recouped $2,000 of what he paid of the total $3,000 to collect this thing. Where was that mount located? You're going to say Baltimore. No. Philadelphia. Because at that time, his museum was in Philadelphia. In 1814, of all the dates he could have possibly chose, he decided to move his museum to Baltimore. Think about what was going on in Baltimore in 1814. The British, you didn't know the British were going to be attacking. And the museum world wasn't very, uh, shall we say, prosperous because of the War of 1812. So the museum didn't do very well, but the mount was located in Baltimore for a short period of time. The museum folded. The skeleton was sold to a museum in Germany. And that skeleton is still there. So think about this. A skeleton from New York ends up in Philadelphia, goes to Baltimore. Now it's in Germany, which when you think about it, why would it be in Germany? And so it's just one of these really kind of weird things. I just find it really fascinating. But here's the detail of the men excavating, keeping the water out of this pit where they were pulling up these bones and putting it all together. And then this is the, the famous painting that shows him showing the curtain of the entrance to come into the museum. And can you make out, there's the, the uh, Mastodon Mount right there. And then down below, you can see, if I can get it to come up, there it is. You can see the lower jawbone of that Mastodon. Okay, so what's happening today? Where can you go to see examples of proboscideans in Maryland and Washington, D.C. area? You can go to the Natural Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution. Excellent, excellent exhibits. 
You can go to the Maryland Center for History and Culture, which many of you probably know as the Maryland Historical Society, but they changed their name a couple of years ago. You can go to the Calvert Ring Museum, and you can go to the Natural History Society of Maryland. And this is a mount of a mastodon that's on display at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. This is a fiberglass cast of the skeleton that's in Germany. So we don't have the original, which at one time was in Baltimore. We have a fiberglass cast. Along with that exhibit, this, by the way, is a photograph of the first building in North America built specifically to house a museum known as the Peel Museum, located in Baltimore, 1814. These are some of the original bones, including that lower jaw that I showed you in that painting right there. These are some of the few of the original bones of that excavation in New York that are also on display at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. There's a gentleman by the name of Charles Breeze who married an Inuit Indian. I know that's repetitious, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew what an Inuit was. That's a native of Alaska. And on their property, they were finding mastodon and mammoth bones. He decided he wanted to make a mount of a mammoth. So he went around and found as many specimens as he could, and where he couldn't find them, he paid people to be, be able to obtain the proper bones that he needed. He was looking for a place on where he could put his mount. And the only place he could find where they were willing to do it was the Natural History Society of Maryland in Baltimore. And so that's what they did. They had the grand opening, was it two weeks ago, something like that. They had over 100 people there. It was really a great time. And this is what it looks like. So you can go in Maryland and you can see a mount of a mammoth, not a mastodon. Remember, the mammoth is the rare guy. This is the sexy elephant. And what I mean by that, these are the tusks that come out in all of these amazing shapes. It's also the largest of any of the extinct uh, elephants that lived in Maryland during the Pleistocene. You can go and see an actual specimen where over 60% of those bones are real fossils, but they're all from Alaska. None of them are from Maryland. So I think that might be just about it. So yeah, it's the first woolly mammoth mount ever displayed in Maryland. It's the first really complete proboscidean fossil mounted in Maryland. I already mentioned that. It's the first, oh yeah, the first mastodon mount at the Peel Museum. You can see the replica if you want. And then the Peel Mount was sold. I think I've already told you all that. Okay, fair enough. With that, I will close. And if anyone has any questions, if we have time, I'm more than willing to answer them. <laughs> Okay, the, in case you, everyone could not hear, what's the difference between a gompothere, a mammoth, and a mastodon? The biggest difference is that a gompothere and a mastodon are herbivores, so they have the cusp-like teeth. The mastodon is a descendant of the gompothere. So the gompothere is early, we're talking 14 million years. Mastodons are much, much later. At most, you're talking about a million years. So there's a big difference in age, but both of them are herbivores. Both of them were chompers, and both of them have cusp-like teeth. A mammoth is larger than a mastodon or a gompothere. It has those amazing ornate tusks, and it is a grazer. So it's feeding on grasses. The other thing that I did not tell you about, and I should have, is what is the tusk? Anybody know what the origin of a proboscidean tusk is? It's a tooth. Which tooth do you think it would be? 
I heard canine. And that's, that's an, a logical conclusion because what are canines? If you think about animals, you're thinking of like dogs are canines. And they're named after the canine tooth because it's big. They're predators. They use that canine to attack. But an elephant is not a canine. The tusk of an elephant is not a canine. It's an incisor. It's your second incisor. So if you look at your front teeth, which are your incisors, and you go to your second incisor, which is smaller than your first incisor, you have a left and a right, number one. It's your number two. That's what an elephant tusk is, both for mammoths and mastodons and gompotheres. In other words, it's a tooth that has just gone crazy <laughs> compared to what it normally would be. Same thing if you've ever thought of like a peccary or warthogs. Have you noticed how some of those teeth come up? Uh, but they get worn down. They have wear facets. And elephants, they don't wear down. These are tusks that are out there permanently. I mean, you could lose a tusk in a battle with another animal or something like that. So why would you go to all the effort to have tusks? What's the purpose? Part of it is you can use them in defense. Part of it is you can also use it to help you to feed. I know it sounds crazy, but if you are a herbivore and you have tusks, you can use those tusks to help bring vegetation closer to your mouth, where your proboscis can then get hold of it and get it into your mouth. You can also use it, let's say that you're um, a mastodon, there's a lot of snow out there, you're looking for food, you can use those to scrape the snow off to get down to where vegetative material would be. Any of you that have been out to Yellowstone, where you've seen the bison, how they take their nose and move it back and forth to get grass because of the amount of snow? Well, imagine if you had tusks, how much easier that would be. There are some elephants that were known as shovel tuskers, and that's because their lower teeth are actually like plates that come out. And they could use those plates to go in and actually dig. So they could actually dig up roots and whatnot to make it easier for them to feed. So it was an adaptation for many, many purposes, including <coughs> what they call sexual dimorphism. You know what they say, bigger is better? <laughs> apparently, I'm not an elephant, but apparently female elephants liked male elephants with bigger tusks. <laughs> because that meant that they were better able to take care of them, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if I believe all of that, but that's what they say. Yes, ma'am. With those odd teeth that they think that there's some people are saying maybe a new species, They've examined them enough to know that, that those odd teeth weren't due to like an infection or something, correct? Correct. I don't know if everyone could hear, but she was asking, why did we not name those teeth that look different a new species or a new genus? And is it possible that they might have been defective in some way or they were diseased or whatever? No, there's no indication of that whatsoever. We, we firmly believe these are separate species, probably new genera, but we're reluctant to name them because in the world of uh, paleontology, when you name a new species, um, if you are not careful about it, misnaming something is actually more of a no-no than not naming something. In other words, you don't want to make a mistake. So until we can find a better specimens to confirm, yep, this is definitely different, uh, you were reluctant to do that. I know of people who would not be reluctant to do it, but that's not us. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, you were talking about the, uh, the three variants um, that were in the tide water here in the same areas and why they were buried in such a close area. Would that have anything to do with apex predators? I don't know if everyone could hear, but the question was, if we had, let's say, for sake of argument, three different genera of proboscideans, gompotheres, living in the Chesapeake Bay area, and we know they have niche diversity, could part of that have been because of different predators? <coughs> and my answer to that would be, the predator probably doesn't care what genus you are. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still going to attack you if they think that they can get a meal out of you. But if you are restricted to a particular type of a diet, and let's say you're in an open plain area as opposed to a woodland area, 
different types of predators are more adapted for those different types of environments. So that, that could be a possible difference, yes. Uh, some years ago, an infant uh, specimen was found in a Largo area I think yes. when they were digging maybe for the that's, or is that a that's, mammoth? Yeah, or a mammoth? That, that, was a, that was a mammoth and that's the angle of wood okay. or a specimen. Okay. Yeah, Largo is the area that that was found from. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the back or? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, city is obviously been able to survive in Africa and India. Why were they able to survive there? He, the question is, proboscidians live in Africa, why did they become extinct in North America? And that's a controversial uh, answer, because some people say they think it's environmental, some people say that humans were the cause of their exploitation. Um, you can read articles that go back and forth. I don't particularly favor one or the other, but what I can tell you is that it's not just Elephants. It's the megafauna. Someone here used the term megafauna earlier. I don't know. Yeah, right there. You get a you get a star for that. <laughs> megafauna means animals that are large. So elephants, sloths, bison, elk, big animals like that. They all pretty much became extinct at the same time. So is that because humans came in and killed them off? Or is it because of some environmental change that they weren't able to adapt quickly? Is it a combination of both? It's still a debate. I, I would not lean to one or the other at this time. Yes, sir. I have one quick question. I'm Ringo from Canal. Uh, the Ringo Tooth, do you know the first name? I don't, but I can get it for you. Do you know uh, that waterman by chance? Possibly. I mean, oh, I'm okay. Like um, I'm from Cal and everybody was wondering. Oh, okay. Yeah, the reason that uh, we even have this tooth is that there's a fellow by the name of Darren Lowry, who used to be a, a waterman over in Tillman. And he knew Mr. Reynold. And he showed him that tooth because he now is a geoarchaeologist and he dabbles in all that kind of stuff. And he convinced, Darwin convinced Mr. Reynold to donate it to him, and then he in turn donated it to the Calvert Ring. <coughs> it's just interesting how these things go. Yeah. It was probably sitting on his, who knows, his fireplace mantle or something like that. And when he realized the significance of it, he decided to donate it. Sometimes people don't donate it, yeah. and in that case, they'll oftentimes loan it so that you can take photographs and make a cast of it. And one of the things that Calvert Ring Museum does is they have a, a, a woman it doesn't work for them directly, but hires out who makes casts. And she does such an amazing job that you take the original and the cast and you put it in front of the donor and you say, which one do you like the best? And more times than not, you're going to pick the cast. It's, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. And so we say, well, would you like to have the cast? And we can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, on the, on the subject of the weird tooth, two pieces. One is like, how did anyone recognize it as a tooth? And then second, any theories on what the purpose of that? I mean, we talked about grinding and chopping, but it didn't look like a grinder or a chopper. It was just so weird. Which, which tooth were you referring to? The third unnamed species, like the third, the, like the unnamed, the, you know. Oh, what? okay. <clears throat> yeah. That was like, that's 16 million years ago. Yeah. So what's going on there is that this is the very, early evolution of proboscidians. So they were still trying to work out exactly what they wanted to be. <laughs> when, you, when you get into the more modern uh, proboscidians, it's very clear. Um, all of the living proboscidians today, they're all grazers. They're all eating grass. The browsers died out. Why is that? That might get back to your question. So, Yes, sir. If I heard you correctly, it sounded like the taller animals were the grazers, and the shorter animals were the ones that fed off trees. The, the, the mammoth is larger than the mastodon, and the mammoth is the grazer. So the mastodon is the browser. So what you're saying, which makes sense to me, is if you're eating grass, why do you need to be tall? Why wouldn't evolution push them down? Yeah. But that's not how it worked out. 
And the other thing to think about is if you're depending upon shrubs and grass, you've got to eat a whole lot to get enough nutrient. I mean, you're eating all the time. For those of you that are familiar with cows or pandas, <laughs> what are they doing? They're spending their entire day eating. And deer do the same thing because they, they have to eat and eat and eat to get enough nutrient because there's not that much in grass and whatnot. And in shrubs and whatnot, it's not much better. So that's, that, that was your life. I mean, I other than the last uh, hormones question. telling you it was time to make or whatever. Last one. No, yes, ma'am. I, we were just reading an article about the megafauna that they ate things like Osage oranges and pawpaws and large fruits. And so when you find these large <coughs> fruits laying around and you don't see them as much anymore, it's because all the megafauna are gone. But they rely, there's a lot of those plants relied on the big animals like this to eat their fruits. We, we know that um, proboscideans today, they do like fruit. Uh, they'll eat a whole pumpkin. Uh, they'll eat a whole watermelon. So they also are a dispersal of the seeds. So when you think about environment, the elephant was very important because they would eat that. All of those seeds would then come out in their poop, and they would spread it all around, and those seeds would germinate, and that helps to propagate those particular types of plants. So you don't think about plants and animals being related to that. Effect. It's all interwoven. So, it's an interesting story, isn't it? Uh, walking with Professor Calvert, like in today, right today, what are the possibilities of finding fossils? What, what are the, Well, you mean find a, a proboscidean? Or well, a, just fossils in general that are related to them. The question was, what are the possibilities of finding fossils here? And they're excellent. I mean, Calvert Cliffs is world renowned. We have scientists from all over the world that come here to study Calvert Cliffs because several reasons. Number one, it's one of the most complete marine sequences from the Miocene period. There's only one other place, and that's the Antwerp Basin in Belgium that comes close. So if you want to learn about marine habitat, environment, stratigraphy, all, Calvert Cliffs is the place to go. When I say Calvert Cliffs, I'm biased. Because it's not just Calvert Cliffs. I mean, we've, we've got cliffs at Post Creek, sure. on and Potomac, and other places. But Calvert Cliffs is the most complete sequence. So it, it's a very important place. The problem is public access. Because even if you go to Calvert Cliffs State Park, after you walk the mile and a half or whatever it is to get back there, there are signs that say you can't walk along the beach because they don't want you to get caught in a land, a uh, slump or whatever, I mean, a couple of people have been killed because of slumpies or on the cliffs. So you can still collect on beaches. You can go to Mattawaka Cottages. They charge you, I think it's now 10 bucks a head. Uh, and from there, you can walk lots and lots. There's yeah, lots of Plum Point. You can oh, walk Plum Point, there's lots of fossils there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even just down the road. On shark teeth and gray teeth and... When I first came to Chesapeake Beach, it was with my family to go at a picnic at the amusement park. And all the kids were picking up shark's teeth. And I didn't, I didn't even know they were shark's teeth. And I, I picked up some, took them to my dad and said, hey, they, they say these are shark's teeth. My dad looked and said, hmm, he was very questionable. <laughs> but they were. They were shark's teeth. I mean, they were common they were. They're not as common today because we have so many people collecting today. <laughs> People out with headlamps collecting at night when it's low tide. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm getting cut off. I want to thank you for watching the next lecture is two weeks from now and it's on the new book about North Beach. So it'll be one to two o'clock. Um, the lecture will be a half hour and then plenty of time for people if they want to buy a book. Thank you very much for coming today. It's written by her. Two week friend Vincent, Vincent Turner, our young master getting his master's degree. So thank you very much for coming.